Hello everyone, welcome to this session. I'm very happy you are joining today. Uh, my name is Svea Semisi. I'm part of the Forest and Farm Facility and I'm based here in Rome at the FAO headquarters. Today in this session, I want to present to you the findings uh, of three scoping studies that were developed by FFF partners, by Agricord, IAED and ICN. And these scoping studies are um, around the outcome three of the forest and farm facility. They were developed during the so-called transition phase, um, whilst preparing to move from phase one into phase two of the forest and farm facility program. And one of the novelties of phase two is that we have the outcome three on climate resilient landscapes, which has not been that of, that of a strong focus in phase one. Therefore, we decided to have um, to, to delve in, in deeper into this topic, especially on the role that FFPOs play and can play for climate resilient landscapes. And based on that, um, these three scoping studies have been developed. Um, yes, for this presentation, I would like to share my screen so I, um, I can show you the PowerPoint presentation that I have um, developed. Here it is. And then I will guide you through these three papers uh, one by one, uh, mainly focusing on key messages, um, key results, key findings, and then also showing you how these three are linked and also how they are linked to some of the other um, sessions that you are either have heard already or are going to hear. Yes, as I said, we will talk about climate resilient landscapes and the role of FFPOs. And I will present, as I said, the findings from these three scoping studies. This is an overview of the three papers or, or documents that I will present to you. The first one is by James Myers from IIED. This has also been published. This is the only one that you can already find online. Um, I will also show you later the link. And its title is Analyze Widely, Act Deeply forest and farm producer organizations and the goal of climate resilient landscapes. This will be presented first because this is the more a more strategic think piece. It's about, um, um, James is helping us to think through what that means, climate resilient landscapes, what different approaches exist already regarding landscapes and what role can forest and farm producer organizations play more generally. Uh, then we will move to a paper by IUCN which is on climate change mitigation, adaptation, and resilience through forest and farm producer organizations' engagement and integration. Behind this rather broad and general title, you'll find very concrete examples what FFPOs can really do on different levels, from local to national and to regional and global, to contribute to um, climate resilient landscapes in their context. So this is um, starting to become much more practical um, also for our partners. And last but not least, we will go to um, a paper by Nora Simula from Agricord, who is, um, who is talking about FFPO's tree-based strategies to climate change mitigation. So here we will concentrate only on mitigation and it will become very specific and concrete. How can we on the ground um, use trees or tree-based strategies and activities to contribute to mitigation. Let's start with the first one. It was the one from James Myers, Analyze Widely, Act Deeply. And I repeat uh, also the subtitle, it's Forest and Farm Producer Organizations and the Goal of Climate Resilient Landscapes. Again, this is a more, um, more of a think piece, but as you can see, it already guides us very well into Mm, concrete action as well. Um, just a brief uh, note, and this is the structure of each session, of each of, each of the three basically presentations on these um, studies, will look more or less the same. I want to start with giving you just the overview of what's in this paper. In this red um, box here, um, it's like a quote that summarizes the, the key objective of the paper, the key content. And then we will go step by step through the logic and the process of the paper, ending with messages. Just so you know, we have always these kind of 
uh, it's kind of it's 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 three <laughs> it's almost like three presentations with within one um, just to keep it also easier for our listeners, for you all to follow, hopefully. So, um, yeah, here we will um, see that we first think through what does it actually mean, an FFPO, what um, power lies behind the collective action. Then we also think more theoretically abstract also what climate resilient landscapes are. Very interesting in this paper is chapter four, where we will explore the landscape of landscape initiatives. <laughs> that is a very interesting chapter for sure in this one. And um, then we will move directly to a very concrete action that FFPOs might take to shape um, landscapes more into climate resilience. Um, first chapter, the collective power of smallholders and FFPOs. Um, we will see similar maybe introductions or backgrounds in all three papers, but nevertheless, I find it also very important to show the, the specific introduction that each of these papers has, because as you saw already in the overview, they go into different directions or have different perspectives. And then it's of course important to see where the author is really coming from. Uh, sorry, I just remembered I wanted to ask you. <laughs> tell you in the red box, um, maybe uh, a summary of the, 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 the objective of this paper. And it is um, that this paper explores the possible motivations and actions for climate resilient landscapes amongst four different sorts of forest and farm producer organizations. Sorry for that oversight. <laughs> Going back to the collective power of smallholders and FFPOs, we already know, we all know, we the FFF and our partners that um, FFPOs have a very strong comparative advantage compared to individual actions or also governmental actions in delivering benefits to local livelihoods. And their role for mitigation is clear. On the one hand, climate change impacts will, in, impacts will influence or are influencing food security and rural livelihoods in different ways. So they, have, they are um, affected. And only land-based carbon sequestration efforts currently offer the possibility of the large-scale removal of greenhouse gases from the atmosphere, mean, meaning only through land-based um, activities, actually, or at least um, this is a very strong um, category of mitigation action. And uh, the smallholders and FPOs living in and on the land and from the land, of course, play a crucial role there. At the same time, um, also adaptation measures will be needed and they might have also significant um, mitigation co-benefits. There are synergies often, you know, win-win situations between adaptation and mitigation. It does need to be either or. And also their FFPOs or land-based um, action is, is needed or is important. And um, also what this paper will say is that a key issue is that we need to better enable smallholders to act as stewards of forests over bio, um, and also over bio, biodiversity, soil, water, and so on. Because only like that we can improve the resilience, sustainability, and productivity of smallholder production. This is like the, to give you the background and introduction before we dive into the specifics of this paper. Then briefly, well, how does James Myers um, define or in, introduce us into the, the topics of landscapes and climate resilience? And then also lastly, the climate resilient landscapes, which is a very specific terminology, which has not been used that much, at least until the paper was also uh, published. So the FFF is one of the, um, the first larger global programs that is using this terminology and is really integrating it in that way in there and in the law frame and theory of change. So here, just briefly, um, many of these um, definitions will be already known to you. There are also different definitions for these terms, but a, landscapes, a landscape are all the visible features of an area of land, often considered in terms of the aesthetic appeal. However, um, Myers also says that the words origins put more emphasis on human activity on the land. Meaning it's not about how it looks like, it means like who lives there, how are people connected, people and nature, and how are the different stakeholders and, and, and actors in a landscape basically connected. 
and like it's more the system than, than the looks. <laughs> Climate resilience is the capacity for a socio-ecological system to absorb stresses in the face of external stresses, such as by climate change, and also to adapt and evolve into a more desirable configurations to improve the sustainability of the system. So it's about absorbing stress and kind of being able to function during stress such as climate change, but also to adapt, meaning to change and evolve um, as a system during climate change and um, to be better prepared. So these two bring us together to bring us to climate resilient landscapes. And Myers um, here says, we can then say, that is the capacity of all the features of an area of land and the associated socio-ecological system to recover quickly from shocks and stresses created by the climate and to be better prepared for such future shocks and stresses. So this clearly links the idea of a landscape, of the connectivities and of the climate resilience the capacity to adapt and to improve a socio-ecological system based um, from, from climate shocks and stresses. Let's um, move on to the next slide. This was, if you remember, the chapter on the landscape of landscapes initiatives. And James Myers has, um, yeah, let's, I, I think we can say a critical um, perspective on what is called landscape initiatives for reasons that I will explain now. Uh, in the green box on the left, you see 10 key elements of landscape initiatives. And if you go through them, we have continual learning and adaptive management, common concern, entry point, multiple scales, multifunctionality, multiple stakeholders, uh, and so on, participatory and user-friendly monitoring, resilience is part of it, and strengthens stakeholder capacity. If you see all these um, characteristics, of course you would say, or everyone will say, yes, these are all very good, we all want that, that is ideal, that is really, really what we aim for. However, and here um, Maya says, there's a huge challenge, because this is not easy to reach, as you all know. Yes, we want to have it, but especially on a landscape level, where there are different, so many different stakeholders and so on, it will be really difficult to implement all that. <laughs> Either we need really massive programs in order to have everyone on board who should be um, on board, really checking all the boxes and, and all these characteristics and, 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 and kind of prerequisites. But that is basically not manageable. It needs a lot of money, a lot of time. It's very difficult to manage. Or can we not look at it um, more and saying, okay, let's just try to find a common ground, yeah, what could, which would also be, you know, a landscape. <laughs> let's all meet at least at the same table and see how far we can go. So then he provides also some examples what landscape um, initiatives are currently, let's say, on mode or um, yeah, happening that are renowned in the, in the sector internationally and he goes also into detail and some of them explains much further what, what they mean, what they do. Some of, um, some of them include here climate smart agriculture, which can be one, let's say, movement looking at landscape scales. We have the integrated landscape approach. We have forest landscape restoration, which many of of you also know where, for example, the AFR 100 um, initiative is then um, also based upon, um, so and, and, and many other um, uh, yeah movements and initiatives nowadays. And he also says there is an increasing international focus on forest restoration. He sees also definitely some positive impact of all that, and um, yeah, and, and definitely an advantage of of these um, programs and initiatives. Local initiatives are spreading, which is uh, very positive. There's often very um, strong local ownership. And also women's empowerment is often a driving force. So also some of these initiatives or the landscape approach, which, let's say maybe in general, can have a very big impact also on gender equality and women's empowerment and inclusivity in general, if done, let's say, appropriately. Of course, as we just heard before, this might be, of course, a challenge to 
keep everything in mind. So that's exactly what he, what he said. Nevertheless, there are definitely good examples on the ground. And in brackets here, I put the decade on ecosystem restoration, um, which is not mentioned in the paper, but which is, of course, very much linked to that. Or another example, very prominent one, of course, of what is happening on, on global scale. Let's move further. So if, we, if the landscape approach is, is such so challenging, what can FFPOs then do? Um, or what different options do they actually have? Here's the link to the paper where you can also, when you have the presentation or when you see it here, you can also find this publication online. And I would like to show you on, oh, on the internet here. Okay. This, um, the paper itself. So this is, I'm now in the paper online. Um, because now we're coming to the chapter where he, uh, Myers is providing concrete examples of what different types of producer organizations of FFPOs can do to contribute to and uh, yeah, steer towards climate resilient landscapes. He differentiates between four types of organizations. The first one are indigenous peoples organizations. He says they are, yeah, they are often identified by territory, or we can also say by the landscape, by the land, and motivated to secure and maintain their rights and manage their lands for sustainable and prosperous livelihoods. The second group are community forest organizations, for whom at least a portion of their livelihoods come from collectively owned forests. Um, forest and farm producer or groups are comprising of individual farmers, and they are often organized as some form of yeah, groups, association, and cooperative. Um, yeah, and the fourth group are processing groups in urban, in peri-urban contexts. These are not really based on the land or in the landscapes, but of course they depend on it or on the product from the land and they're very closely linked. These include, for example, carpentry or charcoal traders, anyone using or trading or processing products from forest landscapes. Let's quickly go now for each one into some examples of possible types of action to help achieve climate resilient landscapes. As you see, this table is rather large. That's why I didn't want to just copy it in the PowerPoint. Um, and I also want to show you how the, you know, how the publication looks like. For indigenous peoples organizations that are often found in the forest core, um, they are often organized, uh, organizations identified by territory and often have low population density in these areas. Um, some of the action he um, proposes are um, a rigorous and effective assessment of the context, context, which will be, as we can see later, important for all these groups. Um, and then also use diagnostic frameworks and tools to really assess the specific yeah, context and, and, and challenges, but also opportunities of, of, of each group, of each well, landscape in the end. Um, communication um, will be, and, and information sharing will be an important part here as well. Also strengthening dialogue and partnership capacity, securing tenure rights is very important for many indigenous peoples organizations. And also he suggests uh, to improve engagement with policy and government institutions. Um, more technical then will be also establishing territorial climate resilience plans and to also really engage in restoration through, for example, natural regeneration and silviculture, and also engaging with external institutions, for example, on social, cultural and donor support. So this is an overview um, of suggested activities, of course, they depend then on the individual indigenous peoples group and on the individual context and location. Let's move um, to the second group, which were the community forest organizations. And I will jump the characteristics. You can, you can look at those um, then on your own if you want. The possible types of actions are um, somehow, some are very similar. It's also analyzing context and options. 
also talking about strengthening leadership, dialogue, and conflict management capacity. Also important training and technical assistance, especially for women and youth. And um, we have also something on communication here, but also if you move a bit further, further down, so I'm a bit fast now, I think my time is up for this, <laughs> for this paper already. Nevertheless, you can see here also some very specific technical, uh, more, more concrete, you know, um, practical, let's say, activities, like, such as developing sustainable forest management and certification, planning forest and woodlot, woodlot, mangrove restoration, and the like. Um, again, the same, it depends on the, on the context. A little bit different maybe are um, the third category, <laughs> forest and farm producer groups, which are mainly business-based. So these are really the associations, cooperatives, you know, that mainly um, organize for improved business and entrepreneurship opportunities and conditions. So here, uh, information um, sharing and integration will also be relevant. Um, also, tree planting, very you know, concrete um, yeah, action on the land and restoration, improved planted forest. But also, um, and this is here more um, down here, the last couple of bullet points, is more going into business activities and activities improving the business. We're talking about incubation and developing business in land use products and services, for example, developing chain of custody, efficient processing, marketing, and so on, and also um, securing risk management and insurance. Finally, the last group, just here, this, this last two bullet points, is on the processing groups in urban and peri urban contexts who use forest inputs. And here um, he suggests to make supply chain improvements for climate resilience and to develop efficient processing and markets, including through digital applications, for example. So I really recommend you to look at this table again and also at the paper if you want to have uh, more examples and to understand better, better how he differentiates the, diff the four groups of producer organizations. Let's continue with the PowerPoint. But here with Meyer's paper, we are already at the end. So um, just quickly summarizing some key messages. We heard or we know already FFPOs may contribute to poverty alleviation, food security, and climate change resilience more than any actors. Very important role. And many FFPOs are likely to find it useful to have this goal of contributing to climate resilient landscapes because they are affected by climate change and so on, as we heard also in the beginning. International programs such as the FFF can help in understanding and supporting such con contributions and uh, such concrete action. Um, and the landscape approaches, as we heard also before, are helpful for analyzing some of the connectedness and, and more general issues. However, we always need context-specific and he calls it politically savvy planning for effective action. So we always need to, that's why I said, analyze widely, act deeply. So the action really needs the local context and cannot stay on the more analytical, um, well, let's say, landscape-wide um, um, perspective, in, in his opinion. Yes, so to sum up, a focus on climate resilient landscapes can serve FFPOs well, and FF, FFF or others can um, really support this very, very well, and this is also very needed and very important. So with this, um, I want to close the presentation on the first <laughs> um, uh, paper, and we move on directly to the second, which, as you will see, fits perfectly as, as let's say, the next, the next that we, yeah, you, you will see during the presentation. <laughs> this is the paper from IUCN on climate change mitigation, adaptation and resilience through forest and farm producer organizations, engagement and integration. Again, the table of contents, the overview. Um, we will have an, an introduction on the forest and farm producer organizations for climate resilience. 
key concept definitions. And then this is um, very nice in this paper is that for FPOs of different levels, local, national, and global, regional, we will look at their roles and responsibilities to contribute to building resilience. So very concrete action and also looking at these different levels. Very, very important or interesting from this paper is also that there is a list of knowledge, product, and resources. And this is a very, very extensive list. If I'm saying list, I mean pages <laughs> of really specific, you know, links to, 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 to materials, to tools, to additional papers. So whatever you want to dive more into, you will find it there. In the red box, I summarize that this paper will be exploring the different options that global, regional, national, and local FFPOs have to deliver on climate change, mitigation, adaptation, and resilience through multiple tools and other guidelines. Let's look at the key concepts definitions of this paper. Um, this is main, largely a repetition, but nevertheless, as it is, um, some definitions might, you know, be different in different papers. I decided to still keep it here, just to have it, you know, all coherent. Climate change mitigation is defined as um, as it involves reducing greenhouse gas emissions, preventing new greenhouse gas emissions to re be released in the atmosphere, preserving and enhancing sinks and reservoirs of greenhouse gases or creating new sinks. Climate change adaptation are adjustments in ecological, social or economic systems in response to actual or expected climatic stimuli and their effects or impacts. Um, and climate change resilience is the ability to adjust to climate related hazards to moderate potential damages cope with the consequences or to take advantage of opportunities. I think this last aspect to take advantage of opportunities is also really an interesting aspect of resilience. As you can see, climate change resilience was also defined in Maya's paper. Uh, he used a different one, he used different words, but the essence is the same. So we're on the right track. <laughs> uh, yeah, let's now move directly to the concrete uh, action. Um, in the green box above, so these three next three pages will look similar. It, we will talk about local FFPOs, then national FFPOs, and then regional global FFPOs. And in the green box um, up on the page, I will always want to, I always copied um, like a quote, I have a quote from the paper itself that summarizes or makes the point of why this level of FFPOs is really also very important and what is their specific role. For local FPOs, he says, the effects of climate change are above all experienced locally by communities. And this is why FPOs operating, oper, operating <laughs> at landscape and community level are the best suited to address them. So I think this says it all, and we all know it. And local level is where the action needs to take place, first and foremost. He identifies three main areas of opportunities. The first one is to raise awareness. Um, FPOs can play a catalytic role. They conduct, can conduct surveys, collect data, forming hubs, and also engage in capacity building. And the second category is to help prioritizing actions and identifying specific implementations and implementation roles. Um, he, he mentions here the landscape approach stakeholder engagement, specific methodology to help analyze, prioritize, plan, pilot, and monitor action. So he is going step by step through this, let's say classical landscape approach. Um, so if you also want to learn more about that, you, you should definitely look um, also in this, in this chapter. And the third category of action is, or opportunities is that FPOs can help improve governance frameworks through balancing power dynamics. That means they can or they should aim from becoming, from being observers to really active stakeholders uh, to analyze and improve governance systems and to ensure that their representatives are um, involved in the decision-making processes. We all know this is not always easy, but this is a very important and, um, tool also for engaging in climate resilience or in, in climate programs. 
Let's move to the next level, national FFPOs. FFPOs that operate at national level have an important role to play in terms of identifying and prioritizing climate change actions, targeting policies, building the capacity of their members, networking and fundraising. The three areas of work or opportunities are they can help facilitate access to technical support services for their members and they can prioritize actions. What does it mean? They can analyze current practices and raise awareness and stimulate dialogue, but also, pardon me, um, but also develop new practices, more sustainable ones, and engage in training. So they have more, more resources, uh, maybe, maybe also maybe better education or maybe access to information than local level FFPOs. So they can really play a, a bridge role and also help their members um, in, in this kind of more technical things or facilitate access to, to this kind of support. Um, a second category is to contribute to national and subnational climate change policy. And here um, we talk about analyzing current policies and the implementation strategies with a climate lens. So uh, national FFPOs are often, they have, you know, they have the network, they know someone or they are already members of you know discussion groups or of some policy they are represented in policy process potentially so they have um, better access to to these policies and can play a much more important role having the climate lens on building networks is also part of that involved in different processes the third and last category here is to mobilize and secure funding for the members and constituencies and link with national frameworks um, so actually this is also a very interesting part of this um, paper. He lists several specific grants that are available for FFPOs and local communities, also for indigenous peoples, for example, um, for fu funding for specific funds, um, climate funds. And here I want to mention that there is another session. I'm not sure if it um, if you have maybe seen it already. It is on um, another paper that was written by colleagues of mine, Jose Diaz and John Kerr. And this is exactly about this topic. How can FPOs access climate finance? So he, they delve uh, much more deeper into this, but also this paper by IOCN provides a first good overview of different funding um, mechanisms that are available. Let's move to the third um, level, which are the global and regional FPOs. And here um, the quote is that due to the important number of members they represent and the level they operate, global and regional FPOs have an important role to play in terms of influencing policy, encouraging learning among regions and groups and engaging with large programs and funding mechanisms. Here um, we will see that um, global regional FPOs can play a big role in advocating, especially also for um, more vulnerable, marginalized groups, um, including yeah, smallholders, indigenous peoples, and women. Um, they can, for example, develop more long-term advocacy strategies, um, make concrete suggestions maybe to the UNFCCC. Often some of these F the global regional FPOs are represented on, on global level and global fora. So they, they can um, engage in that and the paper also explained different ways of, of how advocating looks like, campaigning, lobbying, public awareness, all these things. Secondly, they can encourage learning and exchanges. I think this is very clear. This is also very important in the FFF program, um, bringing people together, um, sharing data and information, experiences, but also sharing access actually to climate data and information with members. That's also part of this point. And the third point is to increase the linkage between FFPOs and country priorities in major global programs. Um, these pro programs are mentioned, there are mentioned some examples such as the Bond Challenge, Red Plus, um, DCF, and so on. With this um, graphic, I would like to end the presentation on the second paper. This comes rather early in the start in the, in, in the paper, but um, I thought it would be nice to have this as uh, for the key messages. 
as you could see, this paper um, provides an overview of how different level of appeals that we see here in the second column, um, how they are um, firstly linked, but also what specific pathways or opportunities they have in contributing to, to climate mitigation, adaptation and resilience. So we have the, the specific areas of action. And interesting in this um, our, um, graphic is also that it shows how it's linked or contributes then to the FFF outcome three, which should not be a part of, which is not part of this presentation generally, but I think it is also important, especially for, you know, um, FFF, members but and also partners to know that and to keep that in mind and it shows us how how really um many of the things our partners are already doing how this is um really directly linked to to the fff um theory of change um with this i would like to quickly move to the third paper which is by nora simula uh, on FFPO's three based strategies to climate change mitigation. So now we had James Meyer's paper more, let's say, more abstract than the ICN paper, um, going already on the different levels of FFPO's and being very concrete, but still being on a more, well, still more on another level, um, another level than we see now, <laughs> because now we come really to very concrete action on the ground which hasn't been mentioned by the other papers but maybe not that specifically and here we talk about mitigation so not resilience not adaptation we talk about how can we reduce greenhouse gas emissions or how can we avoid greenhouse gas emissions to the atmosphere through three based uh, strategies the overview um, we will briefly see what is the role of FFPO in mitigation generally and then we will quickly see that there are two main streams of action. The first one will be increasing sequestration. That means increasing the carbon or carbon equivalence that will be taken out of the atmosphere and stored on the land in biomass or in the soil. And the second stream is avoiding emissions. So we talk about how can we take, uh, let's say greenhouse gas or carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and the other one is how can we avoid at the first place um, to even emit it into the atmosphere and you see in the red box that this paper aims to identify ways to address mitigation in FFF phase two with a spe special reference to FFPO's role in promoting tree-based carbon sequestration strategies. Let's go to the first, um, first chapter. This is also, again, um, partly a repetition, but nevertheless, I think it's, it's, it's always important to keep that in mind. Um, farmers and forest producers possess a crucial role in global mitigation efforts. You heard that also before. And they are primary agents in creating new land use based things because they are on the land, they manage the land, they own the land to some extent. The participation of FFPOs in landscape level decision making is very important in order to achieve mitigation targets without compromising food security and livelihoods um, and so on. Also this we heard before because they are so connected and they live and depend from on the land. This is why um, they don't look only at trees and, and, and carbon, let's say from a business or from an external perspective. They really you know, live in, on the land, which makes their rules so unique. Um, yeah, there are several possible FFPO entry points to join the national mitigation agenda. We will not, um, the paper does not, not go into that, it's just um, part of you know, the background. And we heard that partly also in the ICN paper, like how important it is to join also national pro, um, processes. Um, and the, um, Nora also, also concludes that more work is needed on quantification of FFPO's mitigation effort. We need more data and, and, um, and evidence. Uh, quickly, an overview, what mitigation through forest management can be, or what categories there are. There is carbon conservation, it means avoiding losses, uh, which is one of the categories we will look at. 
carbon substitution, that means replacing carbon intensive materials and fossil fuels with wood. This is not something that is part of this paper. Um, that is, for example, um, yeah, using wood as, as building material, for example. Um, I think, and then the third one is enhancement of carbon storage, which is sequestration, increasing sequestration. So the two high, yellow highlighted ones are the ones we talk about now in this, in this last um, paper, avoiding losses and increasing sequestration. Sequestration, um, there are a couple of slides now on sequestration, and they also um, always have the same structure. The white box is a little bit of a background definition, explanation, and the green one is then very concretely what FFPOs can do. Um, sequestration can be, for example, number one, forest restoration and rehabilitation. I don't think I need to um, define, to clear this, this very well known uh, concept is either to restore a degraded forest to its original state or to rehabilitate to aim, which means to aim at restoring the capacity of degraded forest land to deliver forest products and services. Um, what can FPOs do to achieve that? Some examples here are uh, to remove grazing and browsing pressure by area enclosure, to assist in natural regeneration, um, enrichment planting, which is planting in lines or gaps, there are different techniques on that, uh, and the facilitation of recolonization, for example, of species, and planting or sowing framework species to mimic the composition, composition and structure of natural forest. So this is um, providing like an overview of different um, methodologies and techniques for forest restoration and rehabilitation. So um, this paper is very good at being very technical, not only talking about, yes, we need to do forest restoration and everyone agrees, but also saying, what does it actually mean? <laughs> uh, so I think that's, uh, this is a very good follow-up paper, you know, of, of the others before, which, uh, because it becomes much more, much more specific. Um, sequestration number two, that can be done through woodlots and plantations. Um, they can create livelihood opportunities for smallholders and on non-forested land, they can be an efficient way of increasing the biomass. Um, so if there was no forest or trees on the land before, by planting, of course, they, um, the biomass increases and therefore the sequestration of carbon. Um, what can FFPOs do? Um, yeah, very obvious plantation establishment on degraded lands. Um, the selection of the species should be corresponding to the management objective and the site conditions. So it needs some assessment. It needs also some technical expertise to see which species do make sense here and which don't, because of course it depends on all kind of uh, factors, soil, um, weather conditions, and, and the like. Um, generally, sustainable forest management practices and quality planting material are important same as timely regeneration activities. Um, yeah, and generally silvicultural methods to, um, which are aiming at carbon sequestration. So also here, very good overview of, of um, how to approach such, a, such an activity. Um, and the third and last slide on or part, yeah, uh, category of sequestration is being covered by this paper by Nora is agroforestry which I also think doesn't need too much of an explanation. Nevertheless, it's, um, it's a good um, reminder that uh, agroforestry integrates trees on farms and agricultural landscapes, and therefore often enhancing the ecosystem service, including carbon sequestration. Um, Agro-silvicultural systems, these are different types, um, silvopastoral systems and tree predominant systems. So depending on, you know, how's the ratio between trees and other crops uh, or also trees and animals, for example, something like that. And these um, squares here show how trees on farm can be, um, how to say, it, um, located, can be, you know, how uh, on, it shows different ways of where trees can be kind of planted on farms. 
And again, it depends very much on the specific species, on the land, on what other crop crops are there, how to combine. And there's a lot of uh, the wealth of, of information and studies and analysis on which species go together and which don't and so on. FFPOs can um, promote boundary planting. Shaded cocoa coffee systems are also agroforestry systems. Trees can be integrated into home gardens um, and also rotational woodlots could be an option. Let's now move to the second stream. Now we until now we talked about sequestration. How do we increase carbon um, on the farm? Like by planting trees, having more biomass, having with more um, organic soils, um, meaning we take carbon dioxide or greenhouse gases from the atmosphere. Um, now, in the second stream, the last part, we talk about how to, be, um, to we avoid emissions. And we avoid emissions, for example, from forest degradation and deforestation. How can FFPOs contribute to that or do that? Um, important is to identify the drivers of forest degrad degradation and deforestation, very specific, but often, for example, also um, agricultural expansion can or does contribute to forest degradation and deforestation. So um, this is very important to really look at it on very context, on the context with the specific drivers. Assessing and addressing land tenure questions, also very relevant. Um, the same with analyzing the relevant policies and gaps, also stakeholders, and there might um, be conflicts um, arising uh, when tackling these issues. Um, awareness raising will be very important. Also, the building of organizational capacities of FFPOs, advocacy capacity, but also capacities in forest data management and monitoring, because um, maybe sometimes it needs to be improved that forest is degrading or deforestation is taking place. And also to, to, to measure specific, um, yeah, the specific level. Um, potentially also remote sensing can come in. Um, promotion of sustainable forest management practice will be of course very important. And generally to find ways of, yeah, different techniques, different ways of using the land to reduce the forest, the deforestation rate. Um, using carbon conserving land preparation and harvesting efforts. Also here, um, as you can see many different angles, um, a very more yeah, holistic kind of um, approach to, to this topic, which is very relevant for, for many of our, our partners, for many of you, in many, many of our partner countries. The second slide on avoiding emissions is talking about um, the to avoid emissions from wood fuel and charcoal production and use. Charcoal production contributes to forest degradation. And in fact, um, it's, an est it's estimated that two to 7% of global anthropogenic emissions come from fuel wood and charcoal. That might not sound much, but it's, it's, it's a lot if we, if we look at it from the global perspective. It's, it's really um, a big, an important issue. Um, these emissions are due largely to unsustainable forest management and inefficient charcoal manufacture and wood fuel combustion. Um, as you know, in many of our countries, we are also dealing with this issue, and of course, it is it is a yeah it's a sensitive issue because many people, and especially um, in in urban in rural areas, depend on on wood fuels for energy for cooking. And for all that, so it's um, it, it's sensitive, but nevertheless, it's an it's an issue that we need to definitely look into closely for when we aim at climate resilient landscapes. Um, what can FFPOs do? They can promote sustainable sourcing of firewood. They can promote sustainable charcoal value chains through sustainable forest management, sustainable kilns, and sustainable stoves. And they can also promote potentially alternative energy sources, but this depends, of course, largely on the context. So this is the, um, the second and last slide on avoiding emissions. And this is also the end of my presentation. I'm sorry, I think I had to rush a little bit through the last one. Um, I really recommend diving much more into them 
uh, by, by really looking at the papers. As I said, the first one by James Myers is already online. The link is included in this presentation as you saw. And the other two, we will make sure that, that you can also distribute them at least within our network to our facilitators. Um, and we will also internally, we, are still, um, we will still see how we can make them accessible also online at some point. Um, I hope you enjoyed this presentation. I think it gave a good overview of um, the importance of outcome three, climate resilient landscapes for FFF and the partners. And um, it provided us, the three papers provide us with really three different but very important perspectives on, on the role of FFPOs to achieve that. Thank you very much um, for watching. Um, I will stop sharing the screen. And then I wish you a nice day, a nice rest of the conference. And if you have any questions, um, we will, I can hopefully answer them in the discussion we will have, we will have later on. Have a nice day.